Okay, Steve, the Word of God is alive and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing dividing the sunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and tents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And we always say that the spiritual spin stops right here because we really care for you. Give us about 15 seconds, Steve, and uh, to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through rebound. And uh, we'll close out the prayer time and uh, pick up our study. We ask your blessings on what is taught here tonight that we can use it uh, to increase our, our goal of reaching spiritual maturity. So we ask Dr. Jim to present it to us. And all those are logged on now and we'll log on later. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, before we begin, uh, we will be starting uh, studying Ephesians chapter 2, part 13, and we'll be studying uh, verses 9 through 13. I'm getting ready to sneeze again. Thank you, Mother. But anyway, anyway, <clears throat> yesterday was a it was a blessed day. It was uh, it was absolutely blessed. We had 26 people there. Uh, the fellowship was absolutely fantastic. The food was wonderful. Uh, the uh, the service was great, and our folks actually handled our end of that by with uh, preparing our lunch menus and all that kind of stuff. We talked to the owner today and pleased to hear how how well it went just mark your calendar for the 23rd of uh the 23rd of february It'll be the last sunday of february we're going to do it again same time same place same station and uh we'll get out some information on that but just get that on your calendar if you will now let me go to our uh go to our notes you know we don't need that one <clears throat> let's go to our notes and i want the i want the one with the diagrams on it first Yesterday, we talked about standing on the right side of history and standing on the wrong side of history. And then we, we dealt with, uh, with 2 Timothy uh, 5, 1 through 3, uh, 5, 1, 3, 1 through 5. And we saw that Paul started off in verse 1 by uh, telling Timothy what it was going to be like in the last days. And that's the last days of the age of grace leading right up to the rapture. And as a result of that, we, we went to verse 2 through 4 and saw all of those sins, manifestations of living on the, on the wrong side of history. And I said that if we just take that and look at what's going on today, we'd have a very good, very good idea of maybe what it's going to be like and even get worse as we move really towards in a speedy kind of way to the rapture of the church. What I want to do is take the diagrams now and, and see if we can even further clarify what it means to stand on the right side of history and standing on the wrong side of history. But remember, it all has to do with that yellow circle. So the top diagram is Christians standing on the right side of history. This is true now in, in the period of time that we call the age of grace. That's right now. Now in that top diagram, we've got a yellow circle, a blue circle, and a green circle. And I want to ask you, what does the yellow circle stand for? Angelic conflict. What does the blue circle stand for? What is it? Saved. Born again Christians. That's exactly right. Saved. But we need to make sure that we understand that this is a born again Christian because we're talking about the age of grace. Okay, that's fine. Okay, what's the green circle? That's the sphere of the spirit. Now look at the box right below that. It said living in the sphere of the spirit is standing on the right side of history. So what that means is in the Christian way of life, in the resolution of the angelic conflict, that circle is the sphere into which every born again Christian should learn to live on a consistent basis. You're not going to do that as a babe in Christ. You don't have enough information. It's amazing. You're going to have to be clean before the Lord. We, we, you, uh, you gave us time to rebound. 
And when you're rebounding, you're rebounding from the sphere of neutrality. And once you have rebounded, you're clean before the Lord. But you're not spiritual just yet because you've got to move into a circle. And once you have rebounded, you're going to make a decision, and sometimes it's very quick. You're either going to go right back down into the sphere of the flesh, start out all over again, or you're going to make the decision to use Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13 to move into the sphere of the spirit where you learn to habituate that so that that's where you're standing on a consistent basis. Now, over on the right-hand side of that top circle, we see the arrow moving to the green circle again. We said the green circle is the sphere within which the angelic conflict is going to be resolved. So just because you're a Christian doing a lot of wonderful things doesn't necessarily mean you're being effective in the angelic conflict. You must be doing it from the sphere of the uh, sphere of the spirit. Remember again, we're to carry out the Christian way of life. We need to do the right thing, but we can't stop there because you can do the right thing in the sphere of the flesh, and that's human good. But God wants us to do the right thing in the right way, and that is from the sphere of the, flesh, uh, sphere of the spirit, because that's where the power is to be effective in your Christian life. Now, let's look at the second, at the second diagram right below that. Christians standing on the wrong side of the history. So up above, it was Christians standing on the right side. Now we have Christians standing on the, on the wrong side of history. Question, what's the difference between the top circle and the bottom circle there? The center circle. The center circle. In the top circle, it's green, indicating sphere of the, sphere of the spirit. In this one, it's, it's gray, indicating function in the sphere of the flesh. Now, again, the yellow circle is the angelic conflict. The blue circle is the born-again Christian. And the gray circle is the sphere of the flesh. And in the first box below that, living in the sphere of the flesh is standing on the wrong side of history. And we indicate in the right box over there, the gray circle is, with, is the sphere within which there is no resolution of the angelic conflict. No matter how much good you're doing, there is no resolution of the angelic conflict and you're living in the sphere of the flesh. You're under the influence of the old sin nature, and you're functioning from the source of the old man or the, or the old woman. Now, in the, the last circle down here, I've got unbelievers. The first two circles, the top and the second one, are believers. One is in the sphere of the, the spirit, the other was in the sphere of the flesh. But this is unbelievers standing on the wrong side of history, there uh, is the is an unbeliever still in the angelic conflict? Absolutely. But because they are unsaved, we've we've described this rather than a blue circle, it's the black circle indicating that this is an unbeliever. Now notice there's no center circle in there because again they're they're operating as soulish people, and that's the only thing they can do being unbelievers. So they're, they're functioning in, uh, in the angelic conflict. The black circle is an unbeliever, and the gray circle is not there. But if there were, that would be the sphere of the flesh. You don't need to put that in there because the black circle is going to cover it up. That covers the entire thing. Now, in the first box on the left, left, box on the left hand side, indicates living in the sphere of the flesh is standing on the wrong side of the history. And that's where the, that's where the unbeliever is. By default, as an unbeliever, he's functioning in the sphere of the flesh. And he's standing on the wrong side of history. Now, on the right-hand side, with this, with this, uh, the rectangle on the right-hand side, the black circle is a sphere within which there is no resolution of the angelic conflict. So we got three circles, and only in one is the is the resol is the angelic conflict being res resolved. Okay, and that is in the top circle where you're in the angelic conflict. You are a born again believer, and you're functioning in the sphere of the spirit. Now, let me show you this bottom line down here, because what happens is in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, where Paul, where Paul told Timothy in verse 1, in the last days, know that this is what it's going to be like. And so what we want to see here is the effect of standing on the wrong side of history. And this is in a client nation. The United States of America is a client nation under God. We're not going to go into the reasons why and what they're supposed to do. It's only that we're supposed to do the same thing that Israel did prior to 70 AD when they went out on the fifth cycle of discipline for the third time. 
So what we have is two, two levels of, of circles. What's the top circle? What color is the top circle? Those are green. What sphere is that? Sphere of the spirit. That's where, so in every one of those circles from left to right that are green indicates the number of born again Christians in a nation, client nation, United States, they're living in the sphere of the, the sphere of the flat, spirit rather. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is when you move from left to right, what happens to the circles? They decline. They decline. And what does that mean? There's less of the pivot. Less pivot. what? Pivot gets smaller. That's right. The pivot is getting smaller, which means that people who were once in there are being driven out, and they they're driven out. They're making decisions, but what they're doing is they either don't have a, they either don't have enough doctrine to continue to move on and handle the, and handle the pressures of life, or they're just rejecting rejecting doctrine and they're 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 living in the sphere of the flesh and not moving on so for over a period of time what you see is the pivot the green circle represents a pivot and as you move move along over a period of time those circles the pivot continues to get smaller which means that people who were in the pivot at one time are out of the pivot moving out because of pressure they can't handle it so they move out, and guess what? If you move out of the sphere of the spirit, because you've got pressure in right, you don't have anything to handle the pressure once you get out. So that indicates the declining pivot in a client nation. But notice what happens to the, the to the gray circles, the sphere of the flesh, on the bottom. As the as the green circle gets bigger, what happens to the bottom circle? It gets bigger. So what that means is the people that are dropping out of the top circle are ending up at the bottom circle. And what happens then is the, the bottom circle of carnality, representing carnality, is increasing in size. And that's what Paul was talking about to Timothy when he said in the last days, here's what you're going to see. And we he named many, many things indicating... <laughs> Leanne. Leanne, your microphone's open. I got it. Okay, now. So do you understand those two diagrams? Yes? You're thinking about those, those okay. two things. Okay. Should you take into consideration just in your thinking mm -hmm. about population? Should you think it take into consideration population? population. Well what uh, well increasing. certainly increasing and and, and well, I, I think yes, there, there there would be a ratio, there was something there. Um, but again, there what the idea here is without regard to without regard to population at any given point in time, it's either going to increase or decrease. Probably not going to stay the same. But the question is, what is the percentage of people in that in in that nation at that point in time that are actually functioning in the sphere of the flesh and or the sphere of the spirit? And we, we know from previous teaching that God, God is going to be merciful for a period of time, but there will come a time when the pivot shrinks to a certain point where he will destroy the nation, but those that are in the green circle will, be, will survive. Okay? So we see, we see here now the last statement there, as we move toward the last days of the age of grace, 2 Timothy 3, 1, this is what it will look like in the client nation USA. And I think that what we need to do is we need to consider all that's taking place in the country today in, in many areas, not just politics, but in many, many areas across, across this country and around the world. So with that in mind, I'm just going to leave it right there. And we're going to move now to our, to our document. Again, just reinforcing the idea of what it means to be a, a a standing on the right side of history or the wrong side. And it's only on the right side of history that the angelic conflict is resolved. So what circle are you in? Now, that's for you to answer. Now, let's go, let's go to our document. We're back in Ephesians chapter 2, part 13, verses 9 through 10. In verse 1, and by the way, in verses 1 through 10, 
we saw, we're seeing a, a grace overview. What is this thing called grace? Well, grace is absolutely God's provision, but here's what we want to know. In verse 1, we saw how grace found us. When, when grace found us, when grace came upon us, found us how? Spiritually dead. Question, when in your life were, did you become spiritually dead? Was that? At the point of physical birth, every human being is spiritually dead. In verse 2, we saw grace found us under the influence of Satan. Now, that doesn't mean that Satan's got a ring in your nose. That doesn't mean he's got a, he's whispering in your ear. The issue is Adam had fallen. They began to procreate. He and Eve began to procreate outside the garden. Their progeny began to procreate. But the truth of the matter is that every child that was born was born with an old sin nature. Adam's original sin was, was actually imputed to the genetic prepared old sin nature. Those children are being born spiritually dead, and they had a fallen world at that time. It wasn't like it was in the Garden of Eden. And so because of the fallenness of the world, you had to resolve those, you had to resolve these pressures in life, the problems in life. And guess what? They had no doctrine to be able to do that. So Satan then was influencing them because it was his kind of thinking that they were that they were uh, they were uh, metabolizing, and those those that human viewpoint wasn't solving anything. So they were under the influence of Satan. In verse three, we saw that grace found us under the influence of the old sin nature. Now let me point out something. Many pastors are teaching that we are under the control of Satan. We're under the control of the old sin nature. I want to ask you a question. And this is, this is what caused me to have to say, no, that's not right. If I were under the control of Satan, rather than under influence, if I were under the control of Satan, do you think that, that Satan would ever let go of the control? It makes no sense. Question, if you were under the, in, under the control of the old sin nature, do you think the old sin nature would let you go? No. No, because you have volition. Therefore, you may be under the influence of Satan, you may be under the influence of the old sin nature, but you have a choice to get out from underneath the influence of both those. So don't make the, st don't, don't make the mistake of telling people that they're controlled by the old sin nature, controlled by Satan, even if you're indicating that it's only for a certain period of time. <clears throat> because the question is, at what point in that short period of time what is it that's going to get you out of there that's going to cause Satan to let you loose or the old sin nature to let you loose? You follow that? So you're not you're not controlled, you're under the influence. Now in, in verse four, grace found us helpless. There was not there was nothing you could do in this angelic conflict to be positive. The only thing you could do is get saved. So as long as you're in in the flesh, there is not and lost. There is nothing you can do. You are helpless in this life. Now, point ver in verse five, grace and sanctification meet the angelic conflict. Grace is God's provision. Sanctification. We're talking about we're talking about uh, positional sanctification, and you are positionally sanctified out of Adam into Christ. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you are set apart out of Adam and into Christ. So what happens is at the moment you get saved, grace finds you there as an unbeliever. You believe the gospel. He sanctifies you. And guess what? You're still in the angelic conflict. So God, God, provides, the, God provides the means to get saved. You believe it. You become sanctified. And grace and sanctification meet the angelic conflict at that point in time. In verse 6. Grace provides positional truth. So the moment you believe in Christ, you're, you reposition out of Adam into Christ. In verse 7, God provided surpassing grace riches. So in other words, because of God's grace provision, as when you get saved, 
you're positionally sanctified. As you grow in Christ, you become experientially sanctified. And as you grow from babyhood to adolescence, spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, into spiritual t- uh, uh, spiritual maturity, guess what? As you're advancing, the greater blessings come as you advance. And what we need to realize is because you're blessed in time, you will also be blessed in eternity. It's not a matter of being blessed in time and maybe not out there in eternity. You're blessed in time and surpassing grace riches are those blessings that come to you in eternity. Grace provides all those. Then in in verse eight, we saw grace saved us. And what happens through grace, you're not doing like the Jews were, working for your salvation, being obedient to the law and hoping as a result of that. No, God provided Jesus Christ. You believed in him. That was the grace provision. As a result of that, you were saved. But what happened, you had to manifest faith. And God tells us that faith was effective for our salvation. Now, let's introduce, let's go into an introduction here. Let's revisit the two victories required in the angelic conflict. There are two victories. Do you remember what they were yesterday? There was the S victory. The what? The strategic victory, and there's the T victory, which is what? Question, who won the strategic victory? Jesus Christ. Where did he win it? On the cross. Question, do the, and, and you don't, don't answer this, just think about it for just a minute, then, I'll, then I'll, I'll let you respond to it. The question is this, since Jesus won the strategic victory, is there any kind of relationship that we have to that strategic victory. Remember what it was? What was it? We were on the cross with him, but not only that, where else were we, son? You were on the cross with him. You were identified with his burial. You were identified with his resurrection. You were identified with his res- with his ascension. And guess what? You are, you, are, you are identified with his session at the right hand of God the Father. So he is in the heavenlies the right hand of God the Father, he has authority, he's in a position of authority, he's already won the strategic victory, and you are in him, so you didn't win the strategic victory, You sh- he shares that victory with you. Now what happens, while you are strategic, uh, you, ha- you share the strategic victory, while you're seated in him in the heavenlies, guess what, you're p- physically, you are still down here on planet earth, and we still have a responsibility as born again Christians to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. And the way you resolve that is you advance to spiritual maturity. And as you're advancing, you win the strategic victory by advancing to maturity. Guess what? L- listen, this is, this is amazing. It's not a matter of doing something. As you are advancing, In other words, it's not because of what you're doing. What happens is as you are advancing, you will be doing. So that it's if the strategic victory is found in the advance, it's implied that while you are advancing, because you're in that sphere, you are going to be doing what you need to do. Doing is the tactical part. What's that now? The doing is no, no, the 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 advancing, the advance. See, that's what that's the point. You need to realize that the tactical victory is spiritual growth. So as you are advancing, you are gaining victory as you advance. But because you are advancing, you will be doing what you need to do out there. Doing, is, doing that, that's a tactical working it out, right? Yes, doing, but, but here again, you're... you're, the right you're thing, the right yes, that's, that's right. right. But here again... It, you, you need to shift gears here and realize that it's not just because you're doing, you're doing because of who and what you are. Through him. What's that? Through him. Yes, it, it's good. Yes, it's through, it's through, through yes, it's, it's through Christ. But again, stop and think about this. You are, you, the question is, what is the tactical victory? Yes, it is doing, but quit, listen, Steve. It, yes, it is doing, but can you do without being in the sphere of the spirit? No, I, I, I understand that. I just was wondering, I'm thinking about the locker room, the strategy, and then going out on the field. Oh, the yeah. Oh, yeah, there's no, there's no doubt about that. 
But see, here again, you can come out of the locker room and do the right thing in the wrong way. Yeah, but as you're living the Christian way of life, the spirit of the spirit, the right thing in the right way, that is the tactical part, right? It, it's a part of it. It's a part of it. But what happens, you have to realize that it's not the doing that's the issue. It's the growing, and you're going to do because you've grown. That's where the victory is. That's exactly right. But we've got to get out of our mind the idea that now that you're saved, mm -hmm. that because you're doing somehow or another, that's resolving the spiritual battle. No, it's growing in Christ. It's moving and advancing towards spiritual maturity. It, that's where the tactical victory is. It's victory after victory after victory after victory because you are growing. But because you're growing and living in the spirit of the spirit, guess what you're going to do? Okay. So it, it, there's a, there's a statement, if I can recall it, it goes something like this. You're not, be, you're not saved because of what you do. And that, that's not, that's not going to be, I was going to say it, it's, you're saved because of who you are. That's, I, let's just forget that for just a moment. We haven't not, not changed anything I've said about the tactical victory. The tactical victory is, is, is in, involved in growing. Okay. Now look here and point number one, the tactical victory in the angelic call uh, in the uh, angelic conflict is the result of the Lord's strategic victory. See, if there hadn't been any tactical uh, strategic victory, there could be no tactical victory. And point number two, the royal family of God was created at the beginning of, uh, was created at the beginning of the age of grace. Stop and think that. Let's not let that go too fast. The royal family of God was created at the beginning of the age of grace, Paul was the first royal family member, and that was in Acts chapter 9. After he became a Messianic believer, Messianic Jew, he immediately went out into, into uh, the, the Arabian desert. For three years, he was taught by Jesus Christ, and somewhere in that period of time, through the mystery doctrines that were being shared with Paul by Jesus, Paul saw the light, okay? He, he, he made that transition to believe that Jesus, again, with the doctrine he was giving, and he became a born-again Christian. He didn't get saved twice. He just transitioned from Messianic Jew to a born-again Christian. Now, that happened in Acts chapter 9. Point number three, this is introduction now, Jesus won the strategic victory. Now, the royal family of God is designed to accomplish the tactical victory over Satan. Now, look here. Tactical victory of believers in the age of grace occurs through the execution of the protocol plan of God. Now, isn't this interesting? The execution of the protocol plan of God is not just doing. The execution of the protocol plan of God is going to give you, in that plan, it gives you everything that you need to advance in the Christian way of life. Okay? But our tactical victory is, uh, is going to be as a result of executing the protocol plan of God. Now, I, let's let's stop and think about this for a minute. Why would we make that statement that tactical victory of believers in the age of grace occurs through the execution of the protocol plan of God? Do you realize that you can be saved and you can still be doing the right thing, but if you're doing it in the wrong way, you're not executing the protocol plan of God? Point number five, because Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father and we are entered into union with him, we share his strategic victory. See, we made that comment just a little while ago. And being shares in the strategic victory. So because we're seated in him, we share in his strategic victory, and we, be, and we are being shares of that strategic victory. Now, the tactical victory in point six is only possible when we use the grace of God that is available to us. Now, I can tell you, if, if you haven't been with me for a period of time, if you haven't been listening to what I'm saying, it's very possible that all that I'm telling you is going in one ear, hitting the tympanic membrane, and bouncing straight out that, that ear, and I understand that. But what I'm indicating to you, if you don't understand all that I'm saying, you have the notes, and you're required to take the Word of God and you're to think it through yourself. Allow the Spirit of God to confirm all this. Now, let's begin here tonight. As we begin tonight, in verse, in verse 9, it said, the verse says, Not as a result of works, 
so that no one may boast. Hmm. What is it that's not of works? What do you think he's talking about here? Salvation. Salvation, mm -hmm. Salvation is not of works. Now, I have a question. If, in fact, that scripture says not as a result of works, what is it? What is it about people who are being told or taught or simply believe that you have to work for your salvation or you have to, to work to stay saved? What part of that is so hard to believe? Marshall, can you understand that? You understand? Not of works? In other words, if I told you, Marshall, you don't have to work for your salvation. Well, that sounds too easy for people. I, I know it, it does. That's why we want to get involved in the Lord. Yeah. It, sound, it sounds much too easy, easy to me. Yeah. It's your work. It's yeah. But he says, not of works. Now, let me show you something here. He said, not of works. Why is it's not of works? Because if it were of works, what would happen? You brag, yeah, you brag about. It. And listen, I, this is one of the reasons I, I, I used to, to, to teach this uh, at times of baptism. If, in fact, there are those who believe that you have to, be, have to be baptized to be saved. Now, if I said to you, well, how are you saved? You said, well, by grace through faith. Well, what's faith? Well, I have to believe in Jesus. Okay. Well, if you believe, if you You'll, you're saved by only believing in Jesus, then why are you having to get down in that baptistry? Well, let's see. It says, um, believe and be baptized. I say, okay. But you believe that Jesus is sufficient for your salvation. You say, yes, I do, but I still have to be baptized. Well, ask, let me ask you a question. Do you think that is baptism a work? Well, no. Well, let me see you get down there and not work. Let me see you get down there and get in that water without exerting some energy he said, well okay I, i'll go i'll go ahead and get down in there now what happens is let's let's picture you standing on the steps before you go down into the water to get baptized and out of arrogance stupidity foolishness you've already believed in jesus but you haven't done the other half of this going down into the water and you look up at you look up to heaven, look up into the air, and you look at God and you point up there and say, Yeah, I know Jesus died for me on the cross, but you know what? Nothing's working until I get in that water. You see there? So what happens is that that's foolishness. Getting in that water isn't gonna save anybody because it's not of works, because anyone's gonna boast that does that. Now let's look at let's look at an exposition at. The word not says denies the reality of an alleged statement. What is the alleged statement that you can be saved by works? Okay. Not as a result of, from the source of, not as a result of works, and that would be any form of human good. Getting in a baptistry, helping old ladies across the street, tithing. What are you doing? Not of works so that no one, that's anyone seeking to be saved by their own works so that no one may boast. Boast why? Because the boaster worked to produce his or her own salvation. So everybody that's working for salvation has the capacity to boast because Jesus and what he did on the cross was not sufficient to save you. If it wasn't for me, Lord, I wouldn't be saved. Jesus, But it wasn't quite enough. So if you're out there right now online with me, Today, tomorrow, the next day, however you come to me and you hear this and all of your life you have believed and been taught that you have to do something for your salvation other than believe in Jesus. You can get saved right where you sit. You don't need to call me. You don't need to tell anybody because with your heart, you believe in the salvation and with your mouth, you confess to him. Hmm, Lord, I'm believing. Guess what? You have eternal salvation. Is that good news, Cody? Sure is, isn't it? Now, here's a truism, something that is true. There is no place in the plan of God for human boasting. So as we're just sort of sitting around the table, conversing, disciple type, and we just, you got a teacher there, Paul, just telling you all about the word of God and everything. And he just said, look, man, 
I want to point out something. There's no place in the plan of God for works. There's no plan for human boasting. It won't do any good. So the translation of verse uh, 9, not from the source of works that no one should boast. Now, in verse 10, he says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. For God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, let me point out something. If you're in this room tonight, if you're online with me on WebEx, Facebook, and you're born again, you didn't get there by something you did by way of working. God the Father and his plan through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, they have provided the entire plan and all you had to do is believe. You and I are products of his workmanship. What he did by grace to provide everything you need for, your, for you or anybody else to be saved. That's why he says here, for we are his work, born as born again Christians, for we are his workmanship. Now, what do we do? Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So look here, what he's saying here, the reason, the way you got saved was not by working. Oh, listen to this, Steve. You didn't get saved by your works. It was his work that provided for you so that you can now work. You see that? In other words, getting saved is not the end of the Christian way of life. So whatever you whatever you are by way of salvation, whatever you are and whatever you have become by being saved was provided by God the Father in his plan. The Holy Spirit and Jesus had a work in that. But this is his plan. So we are, we, are, we are created in Christ Jesus, now that we're saved, we're created so that we can do works. And that's the work that needs to be done in the angelic conflict. For we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So those of you who are sitting on your backside, whoever you may be out there all over the world, you're born again Christian, sitting on your backside doing nothing, you're failing in the Christian way of life because you got saved by what God provided for you. And now that you're saved, this is not the end of the journey. What he wants you to do is get off your backside and do what you need to do. Each one of us, if I go down this list, starting with Miss Adrian Garman, uh, I've got you alphabetized by your first name. So Adrian, the Braswells, Leanne, Danny, and Carolyn. As I went down that list, all of you are born again Christians. The question is, what is your spiritual gift? What are you doing? How are you, how are you working now effectively to resolve the angelic conflict? And we know now, if you're not functioning in the spirit of the flesh, or spirit of the spirit, what you're doing is worthless anyway. So it's a matter of doing the right thing in the right way. So we're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And what about those good works? God looked down and saw Janet. He saw Janet last week and said, uh, "Darn, I I forgot about you, honey." Uh, he said, "I forgot about you. I was going to call you, honey, but God wouldn't call you, honey. I'm, you're my honey." So anyway, he says, "God, God would look down and says, oh my goodness, I forgot you, Janet. Uh, I need to get something for you to do.'" Well, the truth of the matter is, at the moment of salvation, you have a spiritual gift, and the question is, are you using that spiritual gift? Now, I realize, honestly, as people get older, that, that, that the, there may be a slowing down. There may, be, there may be things that you used to do you can't do now. But it isn't amazing, Steve, that while you may not have the gift of pastor teacher, if you see me out here with a flat tire, there's nothing hindering you. If you desire and you feel the spirit of God's leading you to stop there and help me do that, that would be the gift of helps. So you actually have a spiritual gift that's, that's a... It's a gift of God, the Holy Spirit gave to you, but in grace, you can function in any spiritual gift that there is. Okay, now let's take a look at that. When did God, when did God prepare, when did he prepare the, the, uh, the workmanship and the things that we're to do? When did he prepare that for us? In eternity past, that's the beforehand which God prepared, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those works have already been provided. All we got to do is get up and get at it. So here we go. Exposition four. That's an explanatory, explanatory use of that word. And it means for you see, we born again Christians, we keep on being his 
emphasize born again Christians who have definite place in God the Father's plan. We are his workmanship. We are something brand new that God the Father makes. We're created. And that word created there is the Greek word katidzo. Say that. Katidzo. Katidzo. We'll see something about that. We're created in Christ Jesus. That is positional truth. And we're created for the purpose of divine good. Divine good works, divine good production, which good works, God the Father, who is the author of the plan, he decreed those works beforehand in eternity past so that we born again Christians would walk, have a pattern of life in those good works. God's desire is for every born again Christian to be working, to be, to be walking, producing a pattern of life of good works. Now, what kind of good works do you think that is, divine or human? Divine. divine works, that divine good, that's exactly right. And the only way you can do that is to be functioning in the sphere of the spirit. Now, remember, if you don't understand what I'm saying when I talk about the sphere of the spirit, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where in Acts and the, old, and the, uh, and the, the Gospels, there was a supernatural power that came upon people. So they spoke in tongues, they healed, they, they, they had the supernatural gifts. No, that's not what we're talking about. This is a sphere in which you work, where you are organically connected to the Holy Spirit so that everything you do is empowered by God to produce good works. Okay, we are his workmanship created. That word created is a Greek word, katidzo, and that word katidzo has three different meanings. Hmm. I well, wonder what they are. First of all, katidzo means to create in the sense of producing something from a state of dis from a state of disorder. Stop and think. If God if God has created us in Christ Jesus, what is the disorder that He created us from? Not being in Christ Jesus. See, that's exactly right. See, and you go all the way back to the to page one where we were spiritually dead. We're functioning under the influence of Satan, functioning under the influence of the old sin nature, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So here's the issue. Katidzo, to create in the sense of producing something from a state of disorder. You were in a state of disorder. I was in a state of disorder when grace found me. So grace found us spiritually dead, number one, under the influence of Satan. Grace found us spiritually dead under the influence of the old sin nature. And everything we inherited from Adam, from, from the moment you were born, we inherited everything that Adam had that was a fallen nature. By the way, I heard someone speaking, a pastor speaking, uh, would have been um, on TV yesterday, and it had to do with the, it had to do with the political scene, scene where uh, they were talking about the evangelical Christian and uh, et cetera. And the statement this well here it was actually they were quoting they were quoting donald trump when they said that he made the statement it was like oh yeah this is right this is right and please understand I'm not being critical i'm just telling you this is wrong and we need to understand it you and i as human beings no human being was created in the image of god except one and that was adam and it's amazing People are told that. So here's the issue. If if you are out here, if you are out here doing uh, some some things, whatever it happens to be, and you're functioning in the sphere of the flesh, and someone knows that you 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 actually indicate you are a born again Christian, and they say, how in the world can you do that? You were created in the image of God. Why aren't you manifesting that? Well, listen, you weren't created in the image of God. We were born in what? We were born in the image of fallen Adam. Why don't you read Genesis 6? The only human being that was created was Adam. Oh, no, you say, Eve was, don't go there. Eve wasn't created. Eve was manufactured from a rib in Adam. Understanding scripture helps, doesn't it? So point number, point number four. Our unregenerate state was a state of chaos. So when grace found us, it, it found us helpless. And when God found us, he, what he's going to do, he's going to, pre, he's going to create something that will be something other than a state of disorder. 
Point number five. Born again. You need to change it, Marshall? Yes. We're going to change the tape, folks. Just a second. What? By the way, when we before we leave, I want to talk to you about your tapes, okay? okay. Re you remind me. Point number five. Born again Christians have, have gone from being a chaotic, unregenerate to a regenerate product coming from the hand of God. See, every one of us we're, at, we're in a state of chaotic. We were a chaotic, unregenerate. Nothing good about us. And we went from that to be a regenerate product coming from the hand of God. The only reason we are regenerate is because God made the provision for everything for us to do so. Now, we said we said before point one that that word katizo had more than one meaning. Katizo means to call into being. And the definition here emphasizes phase one. In other words, Steve, if you are called into being, God looks down at you and sees a lost individual. Now, what happens is when you when when grace finds you, Katizo took place when you had a, uh, had uh, manifested faith in Christ. And what happens then is this emphasizes when you're called into being, you're called into being a born again Christian. And you're being called into phase one of God's plan. Now, what you need to realize is this. That isn't the end of the journey. So being called into being uh, uh, being called into being something, you're called into being a born again Christian with a result of the new birth with potential in phase two. Because you're born again, yes, you have the potential of moving from babyhood to spiritual maturity and having great impact in the resolution of the angelic conflict. But it's a matter of choice, Marshall, isn't it? Point number two. In that the word the word katizo indicates that there are human beings on this earth in the devil's world who belong to God. Anybody in this room belong to God? Every one of us. Not because we're human beings, but because we're born again. Same as the, all that uh, all of you out here on WebEx and Facebook. We reside in the devil's world, right? And that it's that's right, and residing in the devil's world. So the word indicates that there are human beings on, on earth in the devil's world who belong to God, human beings who are called to become citizens belonging to God rather than belonging to Satan. We are, uh, oh, this is amazing. A born again Christian has three citizenships. First of all, you're citizens of heaven. You, you are citizens of the state of Arkansas, and you're citizens of the United States of America. Do you know any place in the United States where you can reside, you live, where you have only citizenship in the United States? There's someone, there's some place in the United States where you are a citizen. See, you each of us here, we're citizens of the United States and citizens of, of the state of Arkansas. Do you know anywhere in the United States where you have only one citizenship? Washington, DC. Okay. Other than no matter what state you're in, you're still a citizen of the United States. That's right. <laughs> but if you live, if you reside in Washington, DC, you're a citizen of the United States and you have no state citizenship. That's right. Well, they just threw that in. That's free. <laughs> okay. What? What's that? Okay, we don't go there. That's that's right. Okay. Now, point number three. Point number three. Katizu also emphasizes positional truth. You are created in Christ Jesus, and guess what? You move from Adam into, into Christ. That is positional truth. Point number three. Here's a principle related to all this. Principle, promise, doctrine, technique, rule for living. So what you do is you take this principle, you put it in the hopper of your understanding, and use it when it's necessary. Principle, God's plan and God's grace began at the cross, and what God did for us at the cross was, is, and always will be perfect. No question. If what he's done for us 
is doing for us, will do for us, is perfect, why are we trying to come up with our own plan? Point number one, what God did for us at the cross was perfect. Point two, but what God did for us at the cross, and all listen, does not reflect itself in our lives. But what God did for us at the cross does not reflect reflect itself in our lives. In other words, you can actually be you can actually be a born again Christian, but your life isn't reflecting it. Point number three. However, after salvation, God the Father expects us to metabolize the Word of God and apply it to our lives from the sphere of what? From the sphere of the spirit. Walking on the right side of history. Point number point number four. Each one of these points, by the way, are a piece of the puzzle. And what we're doing is we're turning the puzzle pieces over, we're looking at, and we're going to try to figure out how in the world do these things fit together. Point four, we are new creatures at the moment of salvation because of what God provided for us in position of truth. In other words, out of Adam into Christ, and at the point you moved into Christ and moved into Christ, into that position, you became a new creature. Point number five. The objective of spiritual adulthood, see, you're going to move from babyhood to spiritual adulthood. The objective of spiritual adulthood, so you, wherever you are in your spiritual growth, God's designed for every born-again Christian to move from babyhood all the way to spiritual adulthood. So the objective of spiritual adulthood, I'm going out there trying to get there. The objective of spiritual adulthood is to magnify our position in Christ. Here you are. You're in Christ. And an ugly creature in the sense that with no doctrine you're still living like an unbeliever but the law the, the more the longer you live in Christ and the longer you take in metabolize doctrine and are applying that doctrine guess what you become a beautiful creature so the issue here the objective of spiritual adulthood is to magnify our position in Christ and to produce the tactical victory from, our, from the strategic victory seated in Christ in the throne room of God. So the idea is we are related to the strategic victory while we're seating in Christ in the heavenlies. But physically, down here on the planet Earth, it is our responsibility to be involved in winning the tactical victory of the angelic conflict. And the tactical victory is won by your advancing to maturity. The deeper the growth, the more of the works. Everything you do is honoring God. What you think, what you feel, what you speak, what you do overtly, that's magnifying the Lord. Point number six. God has placed born again Christians in this world under the principle of strategic victory. Remember, the strategic victory is Christ, but he has placed us in the world under the principle of strategic victory. Remember, you have the strategic victory because you are where? Help me now. Because you are in Christ, and where is he? Seated in, in, in the heavenlies, and you are in him. You are sharing his strategic victory spiritually, but down here in the physical body, you function in the sphere of the spirit, doing the right thing in the right way, and you begin to win the tactical victory. Okay? So when you exist, when you exist under the under the principle of strategic victory, it should lead to tactical victory, reaching spiritual adulthood. You see that statement, Steve. We talk about it more if you want to. See, it, you exist under the principle of strategic victory. You have that. We all have it. Because we have that, it should lead to tactical victory. And what is tactical victory? It's not only just what you're doing. It is, first of all, it is reaching spiritual adulthood. You can't do that without metabolizing truth. Point number, this should be point seven. I got the number wrong. So point number eight, strategic victory, seated in Christ, strategic victory merely places born-again Christians in the right position. Where are you positioned? Is that the right position? Absolutely. If you're if you're not in Christ, would that be the right position? No, because you're in Christ, you are you're seated in the right place, 
and you share the tech, you share the, the strategic victory, but now the tactical victory causes you and I, the tactical victory, you and I growing to, going, growing to maturity, as you grow to maturity, you know what you're doing? You're annihilating the enemy. You're annihilating him. And do you understand, listen, do you understand, just sort of get this picture. You know that when you reach spiritual self-esteem, you're going to get that test called providential preventive suffering. When you reach spiritual self-esteem, the first level of adulthood, you're going to get Paul's thorn in the flesh test. Now, you may have received, and someone might say, wait a minute, I received tests back in babyhood. I was being tested in adolescence. Yes, but the question is, are you, are you being victorious? So you're going to get one. When you reach spiritual adulthood, spiritual self-esteem, you're going to get a test. It will be what, we, what we're calling the providential preventive suffering test which means God is going to provide a circumstance for you over which you have absolutely no control. And if you don't pass that, that's why the pivot shrinks, Steve. So you can be in the pivot right outside of babyhood. All you've got to do is be in the spirit of the spirit. What about the time the, 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 time the, the providential preventive suffering test comes? And you say, oh, well, I'm just, you're moaning, you're groaning, you can't believe this what happened to you. It's like the lady that said to me. Are, I, are you a born again Christian? She said, no. I asked why? She said, I can't believe there's a God out there. I used to be, but, uh, but I can't believe it anymore because God took my husband. He left, completely left. See, that's how, that, it's that kind of thing that causes people to leave the pivot and, and cause it to shrink, okay? So in point number, uh, number eight again, Tactical victory causes us to annihilate the enemy. And here's what happens. You pass the providential preventive suffering test. Guess what? You move on to spiritual auto autonomy. You're, you're now able to stand on your own two feet. You don't need somebody to hold you up all the time. And now you're going to get the momentum test. You're going to get the, you're going to get the, uh, uh, the doctrinal test. You're going to get the people test. You're going to get the organizational test. You're going to get all kinds of tests. Guess what? You have to pass those using God's grace provision, all of these, all of these provisions for you, so that you can move into spiritual adulthood. And guess what? When you get there, what's the what's the last what's the testing when you get there to adulthood? It's called the E test. What is it? It's called evidence testing. That's when God allows Satan to call you to the witness stand. He just like just like he, he allowed him to deal with to deal with Job. Mm -hmm. You're going to be tested. And what happens is because of your spiritual maturity, you will be able to handle that evidence testing. You will be able to handle that. And guess what? At maturity, you are maximizing your the you're maximizing your exposure to the world that God's grace is sufficient for you under any circumstance of life. And guess what you do? You absolutely annihilate Satan's plan. Wow. Now, let me point out something. I'm teaching this. Yes, I am. I believe it. But Marshall, if I'm not if I'm not making every attempt in my life to carry that out, that I might be a witness to other people, I'm failing. All I am, all I am is a mouthpiece that is just empty. I don't want that, Steve, and neither do you, do you? I know that those of you that are in this room with me, Cody, you don't want that. We want to be the kind of examples that will be, be solid. We're not playing some game. We don't have a false face on. Okay. Uh, point number 10. God the Father keeps us alive. Yeah, well, hang on for this one, brother. Oh, no, I didn't want this. I didn't want to hear this, Lord. God the Father keeps us alive to pour out blessings, 
related to spiritual adulthood as a part of the tactical victory. So as you are growing, Steve, God is keeping you alive so he can, so he can pour out blessings on you related to your advancement through spiritual adulthood, spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, spiritual maturity, and he's blessing your life because you're advancing, okay? And guess what? as a part of the tactical victory of the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. Let me ask a question. That statement right there. If you have been with me in the last two weeks, you ought to know the answer to this question. If you don't, that's okay. We're gonna give you the answer again. Point number 10, God the Father keeps us alive to pour out blessings. You know, I wish you wouldn't keep me alive. Oh, and out of here, Lord. No, he keeps you alive for the purpose of pouring out blessings in your life related to spiritual adulthood. So as you're advancing, you're going to be blessed according to the fact of where you are. And that is a part of the tactical victory, the tactical victory in the angelic conflict. And it's a tactical victory of the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. I have a question. Why is this called the intensified stage of the angelic conflict? Question, On upon whom was was uh, Satan focused prior to the cross of Jesus Christ? You look ahead and tell. That's exactly right. He was focused on Christ. But since Christ has already won the spiritual uh, the attack of this the strategic victory, guess what now? Guess where the guess where Satan's focus is now? It's on every born again believer. There's why you have there's why you who are uh, attempting to grow spiritually. That's why those of us out here who have a passion to live the Christian way of life, that's why there's so much pressure in our lives. You say, wait a minute, God, listen, I want to do everything I can for you. Oh, my father, I want to grow to spiritual maturity. I can't wait to get there. But I, look at the pressure I'm under. Take this pressure away. He said, I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take it away. It's that pressure that's going to cause you to grow. Right? What about his, what about his, uh, his uh, focus on the unbeliever? Because they don't want them to be saved. You can't mess with their works. They're not going to function in the spirit of the spirit. No. He also. Speak up because they can't hear you. He is, he's also uh, focused not on Christ. It's on all humans. Unbelievers first to keep them from being saved, and believers to keep them from being. Yeah, but the, yeah, but the, the, the point of the, the point of it is they're they're living out there in life. What I want to do is I want you to focus on this. Forget about the unbeliever for a minute. God may listen. If 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 you've got a flood here and there's unbelievers, they're going they're going to be under pressure. Okay. If you have a, if you have a fire in your house, your house burns down, you're going to be under pressure. But what I want you to see is that in the angelic conflict, the pressure is on you. It's on you, and it's going to be there for one of two reasons, either because you did the right, th wrong thing, or because you did the right thing. But he allows these things to happen to you, so that you will you be you're forced to use his grace provision, in order to grow to the next step. Without that, you're not going to grow. And they, as a believer, can't do any of that. So then, yeah, it's worthless to them. See, the yeah. the only thing they can do is say, "My plan isn't working." I, I, and you look up and you say, well, boy, there's got to be a God out there somewhere. It says, God, I've been waiting for that. And he says, uh, Marshall, take the word of God to him. And away you go. So the issue here in point number 10, God the Father keeps you alive. We're talking about believers. He keeps us alive for the per not just to beat on us. He keeps us alive to pour out blessings related to spiritual adulthood as part of a tactical victory in the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. And the reason this is the intensified stage is Christ already won the strategic victory. He is seated in heaven at the right hand of God the Father and Satan can't touch him. And you read through the, you read through the scripture in, in, his, in his 33 years on the planet, you see how Satan tested him time after time after time after time. Go to the top of the mountain or top of the, the temple. And he said, oh, you go, oh, go up the mountain. You see all that out there? He, Satan offered Christ the entire world. And he had, the, he had the authority to do that because he was the ruler of the world and will be to the second coming of Christ. 
But now the pressure is on you and me in the intensified. See, that's why we have the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. And it is in the age of grace because the focus is now off of Christ. Okay. Now, let me see. Let's move on to in the last several minutes. Moving into verse, moving into verse 11 through 17, we're going to see, we're going to talk about a barrier between God and man. So here's, here's man on one side, put him on the left side. You got God on the right side. And there is a barrier between God and man. And man can't get through that bar barrier, but one way. So let's move on from there. The barrier between God and man, the barrier problems of the unbeliever are removed by Christ's works. That's a, that's a principle. The barrier, so every unbeliever out here, there is a barrier between them and God. There's nothing they can do to take that barrier down themselves. Oh, all this work and everything, whatever you're trying to do to get saved, none of that will remove the barrier. So what we wanna do is see the barrier problems. What are these problems of the unbeliever? And how are they going to be removed out of the way? Okay. See the diagram there at the table? Let's take a look at that table. Here are the barriers that are keeping an unbeliever from getting to Christ on his own. First of all, real spiritual death. Question, who is spiritually dead? Every unbeliever. Every unbeliever. At what point in that spiritual, how long, how long after birth did that, did that, that human being, the newborn baby, how long did they have to live before they become spiritually dead? I said, how, okay, but that live any, one second, see I'm where, kidding. see the point is when did they become spiritually dead? That point of physical birth. So when I say, how long did they have to live before they became spiritually dead? <laughs> All they had to do is be born. See, every human being is born spiritually dead. That means you are separated from God from the moment of physical birth. Second barrier, personal sins. Mental, verbal, overt. You, you, born spiritually dead, old sin nature. You, you, it's only a matter of time that you start sinning personally. The third barrier is the curse of the law. If you're fail, if you're failing in these things, you you you're sinning. Okay, the curse of the law. If you don't keep the law, you don't keep the whole law, you can't be saved. And the fourth one is the holiness of God, His righteousness, His justice. How do you overcome the holiness of God on your own? How do you overcome the curse of the law indicating it, it, for the Jews? If you can't, if you don't keep the whole law, if you just mess up one time, there's no hope of salvation. Okay. Your personal sins, real spiritual death. So let's take a look at these. Those are the barriers, spiritual death, personal sins, curse of the law, and holy, the holiness of God. How are those barriers removed? I want you to notice that when we look here and see how these are removed, there's not one thing that man does to do that. So how's real, how is real spiritual death overcome? Christ's substitutionary spiritual death. Christ, when he was on the cross in that three-hour period of time between 12 noon and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, God the Father poured the sins of the world out upon him he was spiritually alive. He was absolutely righteous at that point in time. And guess what? The moment the first sin hit from, hit him, he he who know he who knew no sin became sin for us. He didn't sin. He became sin by an imputation. God the Father took your sins, wiped your slate clean, and poured your sins out on him. Guess what? As soon as the first sin hit him, hit Jesus, God the Father turned his back on him. That's spiritual separation. So Jesus was spiritually dead for three hours, paying the sins of the world. Secondly, personal sins. How is that overcome? How are those overcome? Before your salvation, you have every personal sin attached to your account. But the moment you believed in Jesus, there was an unlimited atonement, meaning that no matter who you are on the planet, if you believe in Jesus, in an unlimited way, there's no one that's out of the question. You are completely forgiven. Jesus atoned for your sins. Curse of the law. 
how do you how do you how do you get beyond the curse of the law? Here's what happened. See the curse of the law, a slave to the law. How did a slave become free? You had to be purchased from your slavery. Jesus purchased. See, we were slaves, the old sin nature. And when Jesus went to the cross, he purchased our release from slavery. Rede and that's called redemption. He paid the price. Jesus Christ purchased us, purchased our freedom by being made uh, by, by, by being made a curse of the law. We were redeemed. The idea is Jesus purchased us from the slave market of sin. The fourth one here is the holiness of God. How do we how do we get beyond that righteousness and justice of God? Here it is. Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay for the sins of the world. And when he went to the cross, he was there for three hours crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At the end of that three hour period of time, every human being sins had been poured out on Christ. It was finished. And Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Ten lest I. It is finished in the past with a result that's finished throughout all of eternity. It is finished. Propitiation. And God looked down upon Jesus Christ and said, You know what? I am satisfied. And that's what that, pro that word propitiation means. It means satisfied. God the Father was satisfied by the three-hour work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So how do we overcome these barriers? How do we overcome real spiritual death? How do we overcome personal sins? How do we overcome the curse of the law? How do we overcome the holiness of God? We don't. We believe in Jesus because he did all the work. Isn't that amazing? So if you're out here again and you don't have a clue about salvation, you can be saved eternally right where you sit, right where you stand by believing in Jesus. Faith alone in Christ alone saves you eternally. The barrier problems of the believer. When any member of the human race believes in Christ, certain additional things occur which forever, which forever remove the barrier between God and and the new believer. Let's stop and, and, and think that. Just let's just say it. When any member of the human race, that you, me, her, them, when any member of the human race believes in Jesus, okay, now you got John over here, Mary over here, they believed in Jesus. As a result of that, certain additional things occur in that believer's life which forever remove the barrier between God and the new believer. You were an unbeliever. There was a barrier there. But now the true new believer, this thing is this is all gone. We just saw four four things that removed the barrier. Jesus' substitutionary spiritual death, unlimited atonement, redemption, propitiation. But now that you're a born-again Christian, here are some other things that help to remove that barrier. On the left hand side, barrier problem for mankind. You realize your physical birth was a problem to you? Your, your physical birth was a problem to you because you were born physically alive and spiritually dead. When you were born physically, you were relatively righteous. You were self In other words, you could produce self-righteousness. How righteous were you? Well, it just all depends on how much, how much good you did. What other problem was it? You were positioned in Adam. So there are three more barriers. You're born physically, spiritually dead. You have, you have self-righteousness, not, not absolute righteousness or positional righteousness. You're positioned in Adam, but the barrier problems on the right-hand side, these problems are removed by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You were regenerated, born again, and you have eternal life imputed to you, to your human spirit, simply by an act of faith in Jesus Christ. How do you overcome relative righteousness, self-righteousness? Here's what happens. God imputes his perfect righteousness to us with three results. As soon as you believe in Jesus, you have faith in Jesus, guess what happens? God the Father credits to your account three things. Justification, that means you're made righteous. He provides logistical grace, support for you to go from, from babyhood to, to, uh, to spiritual adulthood. That's logistical grace alpha. When you reach super grace, when you reach uh, adulthood, guess what? He provides logistical grace for you to go on to spiritual maturity. So he justified logistical grace and he provides God's personal love.
He loves you. This is this is no longer agape love. This is personal love because of who and what you are. You're becoming like Jesus. So it's personal love. It's friendship love. You're positioned in Adam, and guess what? Positional sanctification takes you out of Adam and places you in Christ. So we've just seen seven things that remove the barrier. And until you're saved, those barriers are real in your life. They stand between you and God, and it's up to you and me as, as born-again Christians, functioning as royal family members, taking the word of God to the world as ambassadors to see unbelievers saved to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. Steve, we're out of time. We'll pick up 11, 12, and 13 next Sunday, and we'll be back with Chaplain Steve on Wednesday. Loud enough for people to hear, Steve. Father, thank you, Father, for this great plan uh, that you have, Father, for us. And yes. that uh, you loved us so mm. much that you, at Turning Path, had this plan whereby we can be saved. Yes. We can function in this angelic conflict, the spirit of the spirit, and be on the winning team. Father, this is awesome. And so very few people understand, so very few people have been taught. So we thank you that this ministry does teach these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks, God bless you. Let me just go down the list real quick, like. Um, uh, Miss Adrian Garman from uh, Little Rock is on with us today. Thank you for being there with Jaron yesterday, Adrian. Uh, Kitty and Troy Braswell there yesterday also from Hot Springs Village. My daughter Leanne was there also yesterday. Uh, from here in the house, Danny and Carolyn Plummer, they were uh, they were there yesterday from Greenbrier, Arkansas. Dennis and Don Ball, they were there also from uh, Bigelow, Arkansas. Then our brother Jerry Simmons from Little Rock. Thank you, Joy, for being online. Karen and uh, uh, her husband were were with us yesterday uh, at uh, at uh, American Pie Pizza. Thank you for being on with us tonight. They're from Antioch, Arkansas. Cat Kennedy from New Caney, Texas. Thank you, Cat. Kim Williams from Little Rock. Thank you, Miss Kim. Richard Nita Clark were with us yesterday from Little Rock, Roger Lamuco, friend from Davos City, Mindanao, the Hornell family from uh, from Antioch, Arkansas. God bless all of you. Thank you for being on with us tonight. I'll look and see who's with us on, on Facebook tonight. Leave me a message. I love you all. Good night. <laughs>